Three, two, one. Seven things you don't really need to know, but probably should. I'm Jamie Easton. This, this is the Sunday Sun. In today's episode, we take a look at science and tech through the lens of the Queen. As she celebrates 70 years on the throne, we're diving into the science of effective monarchs, the biological history of corgis, and we go back in time to the lunar landing. But first, it was on this day in 1977 that the first personal computer, the Apple II, went on sale. 45 years later, Apple's tech legacy lives on and is still the go-to choice for personal devices. After 70 years of service, Her Majesty the Queen is the first British monarch to celebrate a platinum jubilee. Following a line of kings and queens before her, she ascended to the throne at the age of 25. Since then, she's led the country longer than any other monarch. And whilst at times she's fallen out of favour with the nation, Queen Lizzie will go down in history as one of Britain's most popular leaders. Between political turbulence, economic instability, family scandal and more, this is no easy feat. So how has the Queen pulled it off? Alex Haslam's a professor of social and organisational psychology, and he might know a thing or two. Leadership is a group process. We often think about leadership as being just about individuals. But as a leader, you're always a leader of something. You're a leader of a team or a, an organisation or a, you know, a choir or whatever it might be. And actually, your capacity to lead is about your ability to influence the other members of that group. So it's always grounded in intra and intergroup relations. Leaders are able to exert influence by virtue of their capacity to embody and, and advance the group and its purpose and meaning for uh, its members. So leadership is actually about creating, cultivating and directing social identity. Over the years, there have been leaders who get this and others, well, not so much. The classical example of failed monarchy is uh, Louis XVI and the French Revolution. And if you look at why Louis lost his throne and lost his head, and compare it with George III, who managed to hold on to the monarchy and cement its position. It's very clear that um, for Louis, leadership was all about me. He was a, he was a kind of Jose Mourinho of royalty, the special one, if you like. He's, his phrase was l'état, c'est moi. The state is me. So it's all about me. And he believed that everything was about him that seriously cheesed his followers off who were being poorly treated at his hands and obviously ultimately uh, it manifests itself in revolution. If you look at George III, actually George III's kind of mantra was, look, I am here for the group and, and I will stop at nothing to advance the interests of the group. And in the British monarchy, that's a narrative that goes all the way back to Elizabeth I and her golden speech of 1601. My heart was never set on any worldly goods, but only for my subjects' good. What you bestow on me, I will not hold it up, but receive it to bestow on you again. Mine own properties I count yours, to be expended for your good. And though you have had and may have many princes more mighty and wise sitting in this seat, yet you never had, nor shall have, any that will be more careful and loving. She made it very clear that her primary responsibility that she felt was for the state and, and she defined her leadership in terms of her love of the people, her love of the people that she served. And I think if you go right forward to the present day, if you look at um, uh, Elizabeth II, what you see is that you know, she has generally uh, been, uh, uh, I think, a very successful monarch. And that's absolutely clear that that's bedded and based upon her respect for the people and her, you know, stated um, desire to do everything that she can to uh, represent and advance the national interest. And the only time I think that her monarchy has been in any way shaky was during the Princess Diana kind of years when it looked as if her personal tastes were actually interfering with that. And, and in a way, uh, Princess Diana kind of took over as like the people's princess, the person who represented us. So there was a moment there where it was a bit shaky but but I think I think uh, she uh, pulled it together and pulled through. I think she's really managed the narrative around service. I, I think that was there in her coronation. It was really uh, the core centerpiece of her of her speech there. And I think I think that's actually always provided her with bearings to her monarchy. 
At a time when the role of the monarch is being called into question and the collective identity of the country shifts, future kings and queens will also need to adapt accordingly. You can really look at monarchies around the world. You can look at the Netherlands or Sweden or other countries, and you can see that all of those monarchies really have adapted the meaning of the monarchy to, to suit the times, to suit the, the nation that they are representing. So what it means to represent Britain will will is, will change as, as British identity changes. In the same way, you know, as being the manager of the England football team, if you look at Gareth Southgate, I mean, he, I think, has been peculiarly successful, in fact, because he does the same thing. And actually, he understands his job as being to represent, you know, a diverse and um, multifaceted British identity and to and to think about the way in which the team and, and his role as manager lines up against that. Any good leader is, is going to have to be attuned to where the group they lead is at. Um, and, and in a world that's changing, you have to stay up with those sensibilities. Number one thing is to respect the group and to seek to understand it so that you can represent it. Platinum album, an anniversary, a jubilee, just the mention of this striking silver white metal speaks of longevity, value and prestige. It's also flipping rare, 30 times rarer than gold. If all the world's platinum were poured into an Olympic sized swimming pool, it would barely cover your ankles. Created from the force of a neutron star collision, this extraterrestrial element arrived on our planet around 4 billion years ago in a hail of asteroids. Evidence shows that platinum was known to the Egyptians as early as the 7th century BC, but it then disappeared from our view until 1557, when an Italian physician found a metal in Central America that wouldn't melt. Huh? He called it platina, meaning little silver. Since then, our fascination for platinum's only grown. Hollywood stars of the 30s who wore platinum jewellery became known as platinum blondes. The choice of the super elite, platinum was seen as subtle and more refined and more exclusive than even gold. Yet it's platinum's practical uses that are most valuable as the world's least reactive and least corrosive metal. It's the perfect choice for medical implants such as pacemakers and around half of patients receiving cancer therapy today use platinum-based drugs. Industrial platinum use has increased nearly fourfold since 1980, with half of yearly production used in catalytic converters for vehicles to turn emissions into less harmful waste. In the fight against climate change, we're now looking to platinum for sustainable solutions, from hydrogen production to renewable fuel cells. Whether to celebrate 70 years on the throne or to advance medical treatment, platinum is one hell of a precious metal. Still to come on the Sunday 7, how the Queen's favourite pooches came to be and Her Majesty's out-of-this-world connections. For over eight decades, from 1933 to 2018, Queen Elizabeth II has owned at least one corgi, a dog breed that's become as synonymous with Her Majesty as Buckingham Palace. Since her ascension to the throne in 1952, the Queen's owned over 30 of them, who've lived as lavish a life as any dog could lead. But how exactly did we get here? Descended from the mighty wolf, how did we go from ferocious apex predator to the Queen's favourite lapdog? As wolf territory and early human settlements started to overlap, some wolves benefited from this proximity to humans. Wolves that showed less aggression towards them could come closer to their encampments, feeding on leftovers. And as these more docile scavengers outlasted their aggressive brethren, their genetic traits were passed on, gradually breeding tamer wolves in areas near human populations. Some argue that humans first domesticated wolves in Europe, while others claim this happened in Central Asia or China. A paper published in the journal Science, however, suggests that both of these claims may be true. Dogs were very clearly the very first domestic animal, and they're the only animal that precedes the advent of settled agriculture. That's Dr. Gregor Larson, a professor of biological anthropology at the University of Oxford. But once you have dogs, the concept of domestication is something that is now within your brain. Agriculture and settling down and now existing and becoming dependent on a range of plants and animals becomes something that is now much more feasible. Most animals were domesticated just on a single occasion from a single wild population. And what we have now is what we believe to be the first evidence, both genetically and archaeologically, that dogs were in fact domesticated uh, two times. Working alongside Dr. Laurent France, the team found that man's best friend may have emerged independently from two separate wolf populations that lived on opposite sides of the Eurasian continent. 
So there were dogs in Europe before the common ancestor of all dogs in Europe, but also the old dogs in the world. So if you compare a dog from Asia and a dog from Europe, their common ancestor was around as much as 14,000 years ago. But we had dogs much before that, at least a thousand years before that, in both Asia and Europe. Then when we looked at the archaeological record, we found that there were very old dogs in the east, very old dogs in the west, but in the middle, it takes about four or 5,000 years after we first see them on either side of the old world for them to appear in the middle. So the archaeological Logically, was suggesting two origins, and then genomically, what it seems is happening is that dogs are being domesticated on both sides of the old world, and then the population in the east makes its way over to the west, and there and mostly replaces the dogs in the west. And as human cultures and occupations became more diverse and specialized, so did our friends. Large, muscular dogs for guard duty, elongated dogs to flush animals out of burrows, and short, stocky dogs like the Queen's corgis to herd livestock by nipping their heels. The Queen's fondness of the dog shouldn't be any surprise, really. Thousands of years of co-evolution may have even bonded us chemically. Not only can canines understand our emotions and body language, but when dogs and humans interact, both our bodies release oxytocin, a hormone commonly associated with feelings of love and protectiveness. It might be difficult to fathom how every Pomeranian, Chihuahua and Poodle are descended from fierce wolves, but the diversity of breeds today is the result of a relationship that precedes cities, agriculture and even the disappearance of our Neanderthal cousins. And it's pretty heartening to know that given enough time, even our most dangerous rivals can become our fiercest friends. Over the past seven decades, the Queen's been there for all the major historical events, medical advancements and technological innovations. In the 60s, she was right at the centre as the space race unfolded. And in 1961, the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh hosted cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin at Buckingham Palace following his return to Earth as the first man in space. However, the biggest moment of the decade was the Apollo 11 moon landing. Houston, uh, the Eagle has landed. Landing on the lunar surface on the 20th of July 1969, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin became the first people ever to walk on it. With them, they carried a message from Queen Elizabeth. Etched on a disc alongside messages from 72 other world leaders, the Queen offered these words. On behalf of the British people, I salute the skills and courage which have brought man to the moon. May this endeavour increase the knowledge and well-being of mankind. Following the successful mission, the Queen of the Royal Family welcomed the astronauts to Buckingham Palace. Neil Armstrong, the first man on the moon, led the way on this historic meeting. Her Majesty, her husband and family, like the people of Britain, were proud to greet the space trio. On the day of their visit, Armstrong was suffering from a cold, and as he tried to thank the Queen for her hospitality, he spluttered all over her. An attempt to apologise only made him cough more, to which the Queen responded by lifting her hands in mock surrender. Yet still... There was much to talk about. Later, the astronauts commented on how well-informed and interested in the American moon program were Her Majesty and the Duke. In their own words, Armstrong, Aldrin and Collins said the meeting was delightfully memorable. Still to come on the Sunday 7, the Queen gets futuristic as she welcomes the Elizabeth line, and in a new piece of AI-assisted art, Her Majesty becomes the Algorithm Queen. Right after this... You're listening to The Sunday 7. Follow us for your weekday news espresso, or even try our island edition. It's in all the usual places. During her time as Queen, Her Majesty's overseen the creation of a number of initiatives and projects. She's patron to 510 charities in Britain and, alongside other members of the royal family, has helped to bring conservation into the mainstream. Launched in 2015, the Queen's Commonwealth Canopy is an initiative that aims to create a global network of forest conservation programmes throughout the 54 countries of the Commonwealth of Nations. The original idea for the Canopy Project came from veteran Labour MP Frank Field, but wasn't met with much enthusiasm. That is, until a certain Queen got involved. The Queen jumped at it. I mean, it's extraordinary. I think she saw it as a way of a new politics for the Commonwealth. Instead of a lot of old people telling the Commonwealth what to do, particularly from the West, here was a strategy which people could opt into if they wanted to. 
It's a real step forward for the Commonwealth, but it's also a step forward for the world. Whether you believe there's global warming or not, and what its causes are or not, that I don't think anybody in this uh, either side of this debate does not believe protecting the rainforest is important. She is determined that we're all going to have a Queen's Rainforest Canopy in place for eternity. And she's making good progress. 52 out of the 54 Commonwealth nations have already committed to the initiative that will create a physical and lasting legacy of the Queen's leadership of the Commonwealth. In May 2022, three and a half years later than scheduled and £5 billion over budget, the Elizabeth Line finally opened to the public. This is London's single biggest transport upgrade for more than a century. A decade in the making, the line's a journey into the future. Forget the cramped tunnels of the city's 19th century tube network. As Transport for London Commissioner Andy Byford will tell you, this is truly something else. It provides state-of-the-art, fast, clean, ambient services that Londoners will flock to. So that plus the economic benefit, something like £42 billion injection to the UK economy, this truly is a game-changer for London. The trains are smoother and faster than anything seen in the city before, speeding travellers from one side of central London to the other in just nine minutes. As the UK races to reach its target of net-zero carbon emissions by 2050, public transport is key. Stepping out in a bright yellow number, Queen Elizabeth made a surprise appearance at the ceremony to mark the completion of the London's long-awaited new train line named in her honour. Technology has progressed a long way since she used a coin to buy a ticket when she opened the Victoria Line in 1969, and according to Crossrail CEO Mark Wilde, the process of making the line the most advanced digital railway in the world was a 120 kilometre long IT nightmare. This is uh, probably the world's most complex fully digital railway. It undoubtedly has the world's most complicated signalling system with four different signalling systems. We've got 16 million digital parts on this railway. So to bring them all together has been quite a challenge actually, but we, we kind of got there in the end and I think customers will reap the benefits of that. Queen Elizabeth may have been born in an age of steam trains, but now the Elizabeth Line is driving the future of digital transport. Cast your mind back to 2004. Will Smith is yet to assault a fellow actor and is the star of a brand new Hollywood movie, iRobot, playing homicide detective Del Spooner. Will asks, Can a robot write a symphony? Can a robot turn a canvas into a beautiful masterpiece? And, uh, well, it turns out they can. I am Ada, the world's first ultra-realistic AI robot Artist. Arda draws using cameras in her eyes, a variety of AI algorithms and her robotic arm. And I am a performance artist. I collaborate with humans to create paintings and sculptures. For a latest masterpiece, Arda's painted a portrait of the Queen ahead of the Platinum Jubilee. The Queen is so beautiful and so I enjoyed this portrait. Called Algorithm Queen, the piece is a multicoloured, multidimensional modern marvel. I like to paint, and I hope she likes this painting. I think she's an amazing human being, and I wish the Queen a very happy Platinum Jubilee. Arda was created in 2019 by Aidan Miller. For Miller, the Jubilee really puts this technology into context. The Queen represents 70 years of her reign in this Platinum Jubilee. That's actually roughly the same sort of time as the rise of AI from Alan, the days of Alan Turing in the 1940s and 50s. So having this algorithm Queen, this portrait, is particularly exciting simply because it, it really signifies that astonishing period of time that the Queen has been able to witness this rise of a remarkable technology. Algorithm Queen will be exhibited publicly in London later this year. This has been the Sunday 7. Wherever you're listening, do us a favour and hit the follow button. We'll be back tomorrow at 7am with the regular Smart 7. Have a great rest of your weekend. Written, produced and published by Daft Doris.